Welcome to Beyond the Frontline Podcast, where your hosts, U.S. Air Force veterans, Donna Hoffmeyer and Jay Johnson, will help you transition from the front line to the home front. Listen every other Wednesday as they will bring great conversations, resources, tips, and feel good stories that will resonate and relate. Now, here's your hosts, Donna Hoffmeyer and Jay Johnson. Welcome back, everybody, to Beyond the Front Lines. This is Jay Johnson, one of your hosts, and I am excited to get to be in this time and space with you once again. It seems like, I mean, I know you don't know this, our listeners, because Donna and I record these in advance, but it seems like it's been a long time. I'm joined in studio by the queen, the one, the only Miss Donna Hoffmeyer. Donna, what's going on? Hello, I got queen status again. I Yeah, I break it out every once in a while. If I do it too often, your head swells. You know, my husband rolls his eyes every time you do that. He's just like... Yeah, Brian. Know. Brian's going to counsel me at some point. I think. Tell you to that's shut kinda, up. Yeah, that's kind of the way it goes. What's what's happening with you? It feels like you've been back around the globe again. You've been traveling around the U.S. anyways. I said yeah. this Yeah, I went home, actually. I went to my parents' house. My I think I've said in previous podcasts, my dad, my mom and dad own a, a Christmas tree plantation, wow. which is really neat. And part of the plantation is behind my parents' house. And then the other half is up on my uncle's house. So I've got, we've got 30 acres behind or by their house. And then we have another 250 with like a hundred in production up on the, we call it the farm, up yeah, on the farm. Of course. And so I went home because my parents do what they call choose and cut at their house. So people get to come tag the tree and then they get to come back later or just go there and pick a tree. They can cut the tree down. And then my dad drives them up because it's up a hill and my dad drives them up with the side by side and they get to find the tree and they get to drag it back down. They bail it all up. And then when they go pay, there's hot chocolate and mm. there's cocoa. I mean, this is this has reminded me of Chevy Chase and Christmas vacation. Well, I'm Christmas. telling you, it, it probably can get a little <laughs> that way. So my mom does, she goes back and forth every year. Like, do I make the cookies or do, you know, everything's getting so expensive. Do I just buy them? And I'm like, mom, it, it's the nostalgia. And so as I'm kind of egging her to do it, I'm like, that's not really fair. So I flew home. <laughs> I said, I'll help you make the cookies. So 32 dozen later, uh, lots of cookie dough. I don't want to see another cookie again. We have lots of cookies. So they are starting now and people will start coming to either tag trees or get trees. That's on top of the wholesale that there are. My dad's doing it right now. They're shipping out. Yeah, that's fun. They're doing sales. They're getting them all bailed up. So here's the funny part. I go home. It's Northern New Hampshire, folks. I mean, God's country, there is more moose than people. And I'm pretty sure that's actually a true statement. And it's beautiful and it's November. So I'm bringing my sweaters and I'm bringing my heavier pants and my socks and my boots. And it's 70 degrees. Oh, nice. Like the whole time I'm there, it's 70 degrees, 60 to 70. And I'm like- So you had to buy a new wardrobe while you were up there? Well, fortunately I bought some t-shirts and I could- so I, and I'm still Texas, right? Yeah. So it's still a little cooler for me. Anyways, I was fine, but I had time to actually go up to my uncle's house, which used to be my grandparents' house, and go apple picking. Because nice. we have five apple trees oh, up fun. there. I've climbed since I've been wee little. So I got overzealous, and my neighbor was kind and let me borrow his truck. Well, actually, I recruited the whole thing and came up with me and we picked apples and I got a slightly overzealous and I picked about seven big bucketfuls of apples. And so then I didn't I, see those come through the door today into the studio. Right. You didn't. So I ended up making applesauce nice. and peeling apples. So in, on top of cookies, my mom has apples coming out her ears. That's She's fun. not overly thrilled with me. But it was still fun. Well, I got up so. and ran a 5K this morning. It was 41 degrees here outside the San Antonio oh. area. And, and I was cold. I'm just going to tell yeah. you. Yeah. Well, let me tell you that. Not why I live here. That's what everybody was laughing at. They're like, oh, Donna brought Texas up to New Hampshire. So no problem. So I head back home on Sunday. And my husband's saying to me, hey, you know, when you get off the plane, it's going to be like 40 degrees out, 39 degrees. And I'm like, God bless it. Yeah, get home. Backwards. My dad calls the next day, or I call him, say, hey, I'm home safe, all that. And he's like, oh, yeah, 
you kind of took that weather with you. They're predicting snow and it's snowing up there right now. <laughs> Three days of snow. So you're a week late of seeing a white, a white seasonal kind of. Yeah, they're sending me pictures of snow. Yeah. So we missed that. And I don't know where the heat went because it's not in Texas. It I don't miss any of it. That's off. why I live here in central Texas. Because I don't want to. Right now. Yeah, but I don't want to see snow. You it looks nice on TV. We had snow in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did. That was enough. You Once every 20 that. years. Yep. So, anyway. so we got we got a cool episode today, right? We've got a really special guest joining us. This is fun. Well, we're changing gears, right? So yeah. we did that whole entrepreneur yeah, startup good. business. That was kind of fun. Met a lot of cool people in that. And then we decided we were going to change gears and talk about resiliency and veterans that are like getting it done, right? Yeah. So they have overcome obstacles in their life. They're I'm not all about it. getting it done. I love people like that. Yeah. Well, you're going to like this one. Let me tell you, because I received this person's name from actually somebody else that we interviewed yeah. and his interview will be coming up soon, but Wes gave me the name of this guy. Oh, he's a good man. Yeah. He is. He is. And he's like, Donnie, you got to meet. David well, if a friend of Wes is a friend of ours. Well, Jay, Wes is a guy that gets it done too, right? Yeah, so he, is, he sure. gives me the name of James Eastman. So East tell Lynn. us. I said Eastman. East, East, yeah, Lynn. East Lynn. Tell East us. Lynn. Tell, can you give us an overview? I, uh... I, I will. I'm going to kind of read his bio. And I have to laugh because it's very succinct. And I'm like, <laughs> just a few couple words still makes your jaw drop so obviously first and foremost he is a husband and father the jaw dropping part he's an endurance athlete an all-marine ultra marathoner and just to give you guys an idea of how good he is he came in 41st out of over 14,000 in the 2001 marine court marathon oh that's awesome 2016 why not do an ironman he did that in Coeur d'Alene and he was a finisher in that by itself <laughs> It wouldn't be me. And then in 2022, he did Trans America Bicycle Race, and he was a top 10 finisher. And do you guess how many miles that was? I'm afraid to ask. 4,176 miles. That's crazy. On top of all that, because that's not enough, he's also the owner of an RV park. And I've gone past this RV park. It's called Sergeant RV Park up in Canyon Lake. Very cool. And he's going to talk about this later, but well, he, let me back up. He did a fundraiser for Operation Float a Soldier, which is- We know, Wes is- Wes, oh, yeah, exactly. that's how they know each other. Very cool. And he's also, and he's going to talk about this, but he's doing another fundraiser. And I don't even want to tell you what it's for, because I'm going to let him tell the story. Oh, exciting. I look forward to hearing yeah, that. So- this is fun, Jane. I ran my very first marathon was the 2001 Marine Corps Marathon, brother. Is that right? So we were, and I the were same pounding day. similar pavement, but I was nowhere near 41st, just to be clear. You <laughs> you apparently started up front and I never even, you know, got to see you on the horizon. You are well, some... went to beauty. <laughs> yeah. Went to bed. Yeah. Came back and he was probably <laughs> coming. Oh, up. I don't know about that, but hey, sometimes it's about just finishing the race. So yeah, there go. that's Good for you. Congratulations, yeah, James, that's awesome. Well, look, it's an honor to have you on the podcast. I'm excited. I know Donna, through talking to Wes, has already learned a little bit about you. This is the first time you and I are getting to interact. But thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And, and and like you, Jay, I wonder where my bushel of apples is at as well. <laughs> That's exactly right. You and I can hold her accountable, James. I'll call there you go. There you go. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, let's get things rolling. So the whole, this whole podcast is about resiliency, this little series we're doing. And when you and I talked, you know, my initial thought on resiliency was like, you know, we, we made it through the military, whether we did two years, five years, 10 years, a whole career. And, you know, we had to have resiliency and then we come out and some of these people really got beat up and, you know, and what are the great things they're doing? And so James and I talk, right, James? And he's like, oh, hell, my military career was pretty awesome. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, look at I don't know if this is going to work. And yeah. then he's like, but let me tell you where I started. And I went, there oh, you go. So, James, I'm going to have you kind of start your resiliency story. You know, where did you start and and where did this take you and how let's just go where did it start and how did it lead you into the military? OK, so I guess we'll start it at the age of 11. My mom is on her second marriage. She gets a call from the local Catholic priest 
and says, hey, Mary Jo, your uh, your son, my mom says, excuse me, we get a call from the local priest, and he says that Jack, my father, is going away for a while, and that he, ought, my mom ought to bring the boys, me and my older brother, to come see him before he goes away. Well, going away in my family means prison or jail. And in this case, my father is strike three. He was out. So he was going away for a a long time because he never learned the lessons. So at age 11, he gets sent away to the Huntsville Penitentiary over there in Huntsville. And he's there from the time I'm 11 to the time I'm 40. He just got out six years ago. I'm 46 now and has been locked up ever since I was 46 years ago. So during this whole time, you know, I've, I've never had the, the, you know, hey, son, let's go throw a ball or let's go fishing, you know. And I had a stepdad who stepped up and took me hunting and provided for the family, did an honorable job as a, as a parent. But ultimately, that marriage of my mom and dad didn't work out. So, you know, my mom then, as a single mother with four children now, did the best she could, raised us up or whatever. But I've always had this lack of money, lack of reality in the family. So I just w- was involved in this dysfunction. And, you know, what I was telling Donna is earlier in our childhood, when my brother failed, I think his freshman year or sophomore year, I was a freshman. Now he was a sophomore and he was going in one direction. I was going in the opposite because I often tell people that a lot of the time a an example of what not to be is just as important as as, as an example of what to be. Right, and sure. then that was my brother's case where he played the, oh, my father's in prison. My mom abused us. My family's horrible. All this dysfunction. Woe is me. And I'm like, man, I don't have time for that. I, I you know, he, he was starting to follow my father's path where I tried to get involved in church and go down the other way and a bunch of good folks from church and and around the community said, Hey, don't go down that road. Let's go down this other road. It's a lot better. And and, and it has been. So, you know, I told Donna that I believe that I read this book once upon a time that a a gentleman interviewed these two brothers and one was successful. One was not, one was homeless, drug addict, one was not. And I related to that book so much of that, that that was the choices. And they interviewed this guy who was under the bridge and says, well, my gosh, you know, why are you homeless? And why are you living like this? And he's like, well, my dad was abusive. He doesn't love us. He left my mom and she got on drugs and he got on drugs. And that's why I turned out this way. And then this interviewer asked the other brother in this book, hey, well, why are you a CEO? Why are you successful? You know, why are you a great father and doing all these family events? And he says, well, my dr- my father was a drug act, a- addict, an alcoholic. My mom was abusive and all this dysfunction. So it was a choice that you had to make. Absolutely. And, and like I said, I just went one way while they went another. And, and, you know, the rest is history as far as that goes. James, some make it a choice, right? That Well, it, it's a choice one way or the other, either way. But sure. some see it and, and just recognize it for what it is and use it as a springboard to, to be better and change the trajectory, if you will. Absolutely. And others use it as an excuse. So I'm not using this, you know, in relation to your brother, but... I've heard this said, I use this a lot. There's good excuses, there's bad excuses, but at the end of the day, there's just excuses. I mean, Absolutely. You're either going to grab hold and, and, and take control and lead your life or life's going to happen to you. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a choice. Good or bad circumstances will always happen to you. So how you respond to that, you know, is, is one thing. But, you know, one thing I did learn from my father, bless his soul, but he, he said, you got to learn to respond instead of react. And react is a knee-jerk reaction where you can respond and think about it. And he learned that from the pastor, you know. And it's just one of those things that y- you just have to take a step back sometimes when you want to react a certain way. But, you know, as a father now, as a husband, you just got to, you know, stay cool, evaluate the situation to make the best decision for the family. And, th- and I think that's been the difference for me. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. So... So from there, so you obviously childhood was rough, right? You made choice. Your brother makes a choice. You're seeing that, right? You're seeing his choices going. This is not going well. And you fortunately were kind of scooped up into a community that was like, hey, there's a better way, right? And so what made you decide like, hey, let's try the Marines. Let's check this out. What led you that way? (laughs) Well, at the time I was 24 and married to another lady 
And, you know, I was like, I, I was having jobs that I wasn't fulfilled with. And I went to Blinn College there in Brenham. Yeah. And it was like, I'm an undeclared major. And I'm like, I don't want to be a X or I don't want to be a Y. And I, I'm taking classes for, for no goal in mind. And with me, particularly, that's like horrible for life's decisions. So I didn't know what I wanted to be. So I'm at 24 and I'm like, you know what? Always wanted to do this. So I wanted to do it. So I joined the Marine Corps. And it was kind of one of those things, hugs and kisses at the airport with my then spouse. And then two weeks into boot camp, I get a dear John. Oh. And never saw this coming. We were almost married for two years. And she made choices while I was away. And and long story short, we ended in a divorce. Yeah. And I, I was just at the point where I, I never saw that coming. I didn't want that to be the end result of me choosing the Marine Corps. But once again, you either re- react or respond. And, and and I had to respond and and just regroup and, and move forward. And, and yeah, so joining the Marine Corps is just one of those boxes that I had to check. Well, I don't know about having to check, but you certainly chose to serve, James. And I know Donna and I share this from time to time. I bet you've heard this figure, too. Only one half of 1% of our nation's citizens will ever don the uniform of one of our services. So, you know, oh, wow. thank you for, for serving. I've always said, we've had a few other Marines we've interviewed. I've said, mm-hmm. man, when I'm in the thick of something, I want a Marine with me. I'll tell you that right now. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> and, and just to allow you maybe to connect with listeners as we continue to hear your story, talk about what you do in the Marine Corps. I know a Marine's a Marine. Where, maybe name a few of the places you were assigned so we can see if some of the listeners listeners connect with you. Sure. So on this on the west side of the Mississippi, we all go to San Diego, right? A Hollywood Marine versus, versus <laughs> Paris Island. So yeah, I'm a Hollywood Marine. So from, from there, I come home with 10 days of leave, go to the recruiter's assistance. I do that, figure out what the heck's going on with my marital situation. It's over with. I get sent back out to T, which is another, I think, 17 days of training, of field training, guns, this, that, and the other. We get the abbreviated version because I was put in the air wing. My MOS was 6492, which I was a calibration technician. Oh, cool. So from there, MCT, we, in, there in California as well, we go back. I, I was flown to Pensacola, Florida, NAS Pensacola. I spent nine months there in the basics electronics school they put us through. And the Navy goes there as well. And I I think the Air Force is there. I can't say 100%. But from there, I was put in a calibration school, which I believe the you guys call the PME tech? We, is that uh, PML. 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 There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. So, so then from there, the Navy folks and the Marines as well, and you guys, we all go to Biloxi, Mississippi at Keesler. That's right. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm there for about five months. I graduate that school. And then I'm off to Jacksonville, North Carolina to, you know, do what I've been trained for for the last year and a half. Yeah. Well, that's very cool. So hopefully some of our listeners can listen to hear hear you say that and go, oh, man, that sounds similar to what I've done. You know, I don't know. So what I got a kick out of, because I said James and I pre-talked before. Yeah. yeah. Tell James, you spent six years Marines? Five years. Five years Marines. Okay, I thought it was close. Yeah. Five years Marines. And so, you know, he's going in. He wants to do this. He gets in there. And then why did you get out? <laughs> well, well, yeah. So in August of 2002, I, de- I deployed with the 24th MU Marine Expeditionary Unit. Mm-hmm. And, and we're going, we're doing a med cruise because I'm on the East Coast there, right behind Lejeune. And, you know, on the second day, I hear the captain come on. You know, this is Captain So-and-so. I want to congratulate, you know, first class petty officer so-and-so having a eight pound, four ounce baby boy. Congratulations, petty officer. Congratulations, Sergeant so-and-so, proud new daddy of a baby girl. And it just crushed me, right? So with the void of my father not being there, this was like hard for me to hear. Like, wait a minute, these these guys and gals or guys aren't going to see their their babies for six months, we thought at the time. It turned out to be a nine month deployment because we kept on getting extended, extended, extended. And, and and I was just like, no, nah, I, I can't put my family second to Uncle Sam. I love him dearly, but no, nah, my family has to come first. And that was my ultimate decision of getting out from the second day of deployment till I got back. You heard this, you know, at least once a week, twice a week, maybe sometimes. And it was just like, oh, that's that's tough. But you're there, you're a good man, James. But there was a set. The one that's the part I wasn't giggling at. The second part of it, 
<laughs> you had said to me that what did you not like? You're like, I realized I didn't like. Well, the thing was, is I, I, I realized that by, by, I, I didn't like being told where to be, <laughs> what to wear, when to be there. And in the Marine Corps, you're 15 prior to being there. And then your superior has you 15 prior to 15 prior. And yeah. it just all goes downhill from there. And yeah. I was just like, I, this is just hard for me to accept, you know? Yeah. This, this but, explains a lot to me, just getting to meet you now. Now I know why you're an entrepreneur. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you saying that part of it? I just cracked up. I was all like, I can oh. say to that is me too, brother. Me too. That's why. Yeah. I, all, all of us have been through it. Absolutely. There's always somebody above you. That's right. <laughs> oh, There's God. another way of saying that James. I, I don't know. Can I squeak you, it in? I'll do it can. without being too colorful. You can. There's, there's an old saying about a sled dog team, right? The dogs bark, but the caravan moves on, but the scenery never changes unless you're the lead dog. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Right? Uh, I love it. Yeah. That and the rest of that. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. I like that. Yeah, Let's, yeah. The see, the, see the kind of trouble we get in on these yeah. podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> see, that's what led. He was like, "Okay, no go." That's fine. like, yeah. That's why I was laughing. I'm like, no, I wasn't but laughing he, about the baby thing because that. But he faithfully served. Yeah, he you did. Know what I mean? He did. If, if we only had more of our population willing to stand up. And, I know, uh, and this, he did. This country Absolutely. is up for so. very, very much so. And so he he did, right, James? So you decided, like, hey, this whole telling me where to be and all that, this is not for me. Okay. <laughs> so that's when you decided to exit left there, realizing that this is not compatible anymore. <laughs> th that's right, you know. So at this point, exiting the Marine Corps, I was twenty nine, and and when you have maybe some twenty two year olds that are at your same rank but not maturity level. And they, they want to party where that's not my kind of thing. Now, surprise, surprise, not every Marine goes out and parties hard like they do every weekend. But, that's a, but, that is actually impressive. <laughs> well, well, keep in mind, you know, when they're out doing the drinking thing or whatever, I'm I'm either, you know, with a headlamp on and I'm training behind Camp Lejeune yeah. out of the back of the air station running 20 milers at two in the morning. That's awesome. You know, and, and, and passing people from Camp Geiger, Camp Johnson back there. And, and that was the difference for me is I'm just not a, a partier kind of guy like that where, where I have goals and ambitions in life. And again, I didn't want to follow that that path of the family. Well, let's back that up because that's actually important to where you're at now is that you found out, well, this is a little, it is kind of cute. He found out when he was younger that he had a lot of stamina <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah. you know, childhood wasn't so awesome, right? And yeah. so he could outrun things like his brother. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So I, I told Donna this story before that, you know, when I was younger, I might've been 10 or 11, you know, I found out that I had this ability to run and my brother, he was a lot stronger than me, a lot more physical than me, a whole heck of a lot meaner. And I know if he was coming after me, all I had to do is get out of the house and the back door and run to the woods and I can bob and weave and outrun him because you know, I'm an endurance athlete. But if he caught me before the woods, he had beat the mess out of me, you know. But if I could get to the woods, I'd outrun him and get away from him. And, and I think that's kind of where my running got conditioned I, to go the longer and longer. James, I can't help it. I just now I've got him. We went earlier from one, you know, Christmas vacation image to your story, Donna. Now I see Forrest Gump for some reason. I <laughs> just run, yeah. James, run, man. So he got yes. So like he said, you know, from that moment when my brother chased me, from that moment on, I was running. <laughs> <laughs> James, that's so good. So yeah. Military and he's in there. Do it was like might as well do a marathon and That's heck, you were doing that without anybody chasing you, which is even more impressive. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's just you know one of those abilities. God, God blesses people with this gift, that gift, or the other. Mine just happened to be an endurance, and 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 I got into it involuntarily. But then while in the Marine Corps, got on ultra on the All Marine Ultra Marathon team and ran the JFK fifty miler. I think two or three times up there. So when you but, ran the Marine Corps Marathon in, in 2001, were you, did you do that with this team, this Marine team, or did you do that as, a, as an individual? Oh, no, I was an individual. What I had done is I I got on base. I think I won a race or two. I yeah. set myself out from school in Biloxi of running a very fast PFT three-mile time of, I think it was 15 or high 14s or whatever. And these guys were, you know, the, the, the higher, the master sergeant that we never see, you know, shows up in the gunny, you know, and they have nothing to do with the school. 
directly with the little trainees like us. But then when they hear this guy's going to run, they all come out and want to see. Yeah. Well, long story short, you know, th- this come all about. And I-, I just realized I had this thing. And then the the I had a captain, I forget his name, Sean Forrester, Captain Forrester from Camp Lejeune contacted my gunny, contacted me and said, hey, send this devil dog over here. I want to talk to him. Okay. And they're like, what did you do, Corporal? What did you do? And I'm like, I don't know. I, don't, I don't have no idea, you know? <laughs> so I go over to meet this captain at, at Camp Lejeune. And he's like, hey, I heard you're an ultra marathon. I heard you're this. I heard you're that. You know, hey, would you want to do adventure racing? So I started doing adventure racing. Now, keep this in mind. You have a, I think I just picked up Corporal at the time, E4. Yep. And I'm, I'm doing these adventure races with captains and lieutenants, majors, and lieutenant colonels. And yep. I think there was a master sergeant or a master guns at the 2001 Marine Corps Marathon. So here I am like, ah, you know, don't say the wrong thing in front of all these people. Yeah. And, and, and just the reputation started going out there. So the next thing you know, I'm running the Marine Corps Marathon on Marine Corps Air Station New Rivers Marathon team they send up there. And come to find out, I was the fifth active duty Marine to cross the finish line. And the commandant, I think it was General Jones at the time, if I'm not mistaken, he's standing there at the finish line. I hear tales of this like four months later at some of these races. And he's like, who's that Marine? Why is he not on the team? Who's that Marine? Why is he not on the team? (laughs) And here I come, the fifth one, beating, I think, five of the ones who are on the all-Marine team of like, why isn't that devil dog on the team? Well, you hear the story later, and it's because I didn't have the clout. At the time I applied for the all-Marine team, I was a Lance Corporal at E3. So, you know, and, and, and that's what I tell my kids. Hey, look, pick a sport where you can't deny time or that's distance right. or whatever versus a judgment of a, a right. ball player or something like that. You know, well, I, so, I feel compelled to say cry havoc and release the, you know, release the dogs of war, man. It's <laughs> hey, you know what, James, just from a nostalgic standpoint, Donna will bring us back on track. She's used to me. The the 2001 Marine Corps Marathon happened about, what, five, six weeks after 9-11. Mm-hmm. And I have to tell you, you know, the first five miles coming out underneath that bridge, there's the Pentagon. There's yes. that gaping hole with giant American flag draped down. Brother, I've never felt Get more patriotic, it. more focused on, you mm-hmm. know, what we were there to do. It, it was an incredible event that I'll never forget. The people lying in the streets chanting USA, I still hear in my mind. It's It was a- a- absolutely, absolutely. And the, the, the chain link fence around the Pentagon is what I remember and all the barricades and the big hole. And I, it's it just like. To, to see it is surreal. I mean, yeah. you hear about it, but when you're there, you know, it just takes it to a yeah. place, yeah. man, of, of, of gratitude for everybody that does serve and, and, and that sacrificed, you know? Yeah. Thank you for yours. That's impressive. All right. So, so we, so now you find out that you got some stamina and, and you put it to the test and, and all that. And then you realize yeah, family's going to come first, and, and I really don't like everybody telling me what to do. <laughs> so it's time to go. So you, you decide to separate, right? It's time to go. You want to go on. What, when you were separating, what was your mindset on, get like, was it like, I'm just getting out, or did you have a game plan, or? Well, now keep in mind, I got out when it was 2005, Okay. Mm-hmm. I was 29 and all I knew I wanted to do or have was a job or a career or a, a passive residual income of some sort where no one for the rest of my life could tell me where to be, what to do, what to wear. I wanted to be free. And, and, and I say freedom in the sense of, you know, going and doing these races or being a dad that takes off to go coach the softball, my, my 12 year girls, you know, on the team I'm assistant and coach for. And, and it was that freedom that inspired me of to find that. So while in the Marine Corps, amongst all this training and whatnot, I'm driving cabs at nighttime. Always been an entrepreneur. And, and, a, and a buddy of mine invited me to drive his cab. He was, a I think, a Lance Corporal. I just picked up Corporal. And he's like, hey, if you want to earn extra money, you can drive my cab. So I started driving his cab. And then after about two weeks, you know, I'm not the smartest Marine, but I'm not the dumbest either. And I was like, you know what, man, I can get my own cab and do the same thing here. So I started doing that. So I bought a cab. I drove it to base, off base. You know, at Fridays, I try to get get the, the cab fare up to Raleigh-Durham. You know, that's about $170 fare at the time, you know. So so I started hustling that. So when I got out, I was like, I need something like that. So I got my loan officer license to work at a mortgage company. Now, this was just before 
the real estate market fell out and crashed when all the foreclosures were going on. So here I am in Canyon Lake, the new, I wouldn't call myself a loan officer, wannabe loan officer, and nobody's giving me the loans because I'm the new guy in a, in a failing market and economy. So then I was like, man, I've got to do something. So there was an Air Force veteran, Armando Garcia, here in Sattler, here in Canyon Lake. And he says, James, hey, I know you're not closing any home loans. Do you have a chainsaw? So I'm like, no, Armando, but I can get one. What's up? He's like, hey, I've got this lot over here. I just bought it. He just sold the business, so he had some money to invest. Hey, I've got this lot over here. Go quote me, a, quote me a price on what you charge me to clear it. So I said, bet. So I go look at the lot. I'm like, it's like two acres. And I'm like, a chainsaw? Man, I can do this in two days. I bid it for 600 bucks. Little did I know the jobs were going for 1500 uh -oh. Okay. <laughs> So anyway, I've got a lot smarter since then, but at the time, ignorance is bliss. So I'm like, hey, man, two days, 600 bucks is more than I'm making on home loans. So I go over there and he's like, do it, James. So I go over there and this home builder says, Armando, who did you get this guy to clear this lot? You know, because I did it all by hand. There's no tire marks on there from a skid steer or a dozer. So I'm doing all this. And, and one thing led to another. So I had by default of the home, of the loan officer had a land clearing business I started. So, <laughs> All, all that being said, you know, this property, I, I did a, a lease option on a little 0.95 acre and the real and the homeowner who was a realtor at the time lived in East Texas. He says, hey, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll lease option this acre to you. No problem. So I lease option. I, I, he wanted to lease it. I wanted to lease option it and purchase it. So long story short, I think a year goes by. I purchased the land and and had some buildings on it. So I rented these buildings out for boat and RV storage. And that's how Sergeant's boat and RV storage started here on my facility as well. Love it. So I love it, man. You have been an entrepreneurial spirit for a long time. I call you like the organic entrepreneur. Cause I mean, really, <laughs> I've always said from a passive income standpoint, right. The people who own RV storage lots and things are brilliant. Yeah. They're brilliant. Yeah. Even well, you're sleeping even while you're well, sleeping. <laughs> success you're, you're, you just have to mimic it you know if just if you see someone successful just do what they're doing you know yeah. if it's legal ethical and moral you know but <laughs> yeah, yeah. i love that <laughs> I, I say to people all the time success leaves footprints right and absolutely instead of reinventing the wheel you may have your own spin on it but you right. can from others and i love that you just said that but what was really what i like is that you didn't you know i <laughs> i have friends right now that that have somebody staying with them and they they ended up in a situation where they were renting and then the, the owners want to move in, right? So they had to get out in 30 days. So they said, well, come stay with us. And so they're letting them stay. But what what they're finding out, like, I think he got like laid off from his job or something. They're being like very particular about getting a job. And so they're like writing off a lot of stuff and, and they're staying with fr these friends and they're like, why are you not picking up a job? There's like 8,000 jobs. Oh, well, that doesn't, oh, well, this one, where you were over there like, oh, you want me to clear the land? Sure, let me go get a chainsaw. Like, That's, why I like him. That's who I am too, right? But again, I can't help it to the listeners. This is just who I am. Now I'm hearing Cousin Eddie back in Christmas vacation. <laughs> well, Clark, I'm holding out for a management job. You know, I... Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, well, we're, you know, like they say, when one door closes, another opens. In my yes. case, if it doesn't open, I'm kicking it down and going through it yes. just because that's my mentality. You know, I, I've got to be successful in life and I want to give my kids more than I had. So, you know, let's get it you know the quicker yes. you just suck it up and get through it and, and deal with the the lack of a better term poo or crap or whatever you want to say just crap. get through it it's fine Donna uses okay okay Very so, <laughs> yeah so the quicker you get through the crap you know the the quicker you get to the roses at the end you know yeah. so I'm always the one in control. Mind my words. Donna's over here Whatever. making sailors blush. Oh, right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Way to go, Donna. <laughs> over the last year, trust me. He was the straight lace one. I just don't think it's happening anymore. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, yeah. So we, so now you're like, hey, why not? So now you have basically clearing land, right? Sort of landscaping ish business, right? And, yeah. and now you have, boat storage rv and boat storage and so you're right. doing those two things somewhere in there you got remarried right correct correct and so 
so here's the kicker. So in boot camp, you know, that was 2000, 2005, I get out. I start selling these cedar posts from these lots I clear. I started harvesting cedar posts and I can go make two, two to 400 bucks a day, you know? And I'm thinking, man, in the core, you'd get lucky to 600 bucks on a paycheck for two weeks yeah. because I didn't have BAH. I didn't have a, none of that stuff. You know, comrades live out in town. So I'm like living like a king thinking, man, I'm making mint, you know? So I, I start cutting these posts. And I drove them from Canyon Lake all the way down to Gonzales. And I would cut a load of posts on the back of this flatbed truck my cousin sold me. So I'd go down there at the end of the day. I'd get to Wells Fargo here in New Braunfels at, the, at maybe 5 o'clock, 5.30, just before closing. And I would cash my check. And every time, I'm, I was at the time horrible with finances. So I'd cash my check and take the cash. And sometimes they would say, hey, you know, you don't have enough in your account to cash this check, but we're going to have to deposit it. So I'd, I'd deposit it. And the next day I'd go back through, I'd cash this check and pull out the cash from the next one, right? Marine for math didn't, wasn't my strong subject, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I go through and this lady, Winter, my now wife, worked at the commercial drive through lane. So I'm, now imagine this 86 white, black flatbed truck going through with loud pipes. It's a dually one ton. You know, she's from East Texas kind of gal. So every time I pull through the drive, I didn't know this till months later. Every time I pull in the drive through in the commercial lane, I'm covered head to toe in cedar bark and sap and cut off sleeves and cowboy hat and a one ton dually. And they knew Winter was from East Texas, country gal. And they said, hey, Winter, it's one of your people. And they would make her deal with me. <laughs> so so anyway, that was the joke that I'm one of her people. So well, anyway, long story short, a couple I don't know, maybe a, a, a two weeks go by. And I'm like, you know, she's kind of cute. <laughs> so I put on the back of this card and she's kept it till today. It, awesome. it says dinner, Bud Light movie, eight o'clock, question mark. And oh, I put it back sweet. through there. <laughs> your cowboy so, hat and cedar pitch face. Oh, you hey, made an she must have. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, l long story. I'm the lucky one because we went that night at the grist mill on our <laughs> first date. You know, and, and we rode in her car because I was so embarrassed. She's not riding in my work truck because that's all the time I, all the, the only truck I had at the time, right? So we go to the grist mill and have, have lunch. And, and I think two and a half months later, we're married. That's awesome. Oh my gosh. Well, you know yeah, what this thing, James, behind every great man is a, is a great greater woman, woman. right? <laughs> that, that's absolutely right. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, she, she is a blessing to me, but hundred percent. Yeah. Awesome. I always joke with, people you know that she found such a good guy she just couldn't let him go <laughs> yeah i love look i i love every bit of your story your spirit your man you're you're really good at finding your way to yes james that's what i like to call it right opportunity presents itself some people sit there and have to think about it and other people just find their way to yes and that's it yeah, so I'm listening to you unpack this i know don is driving us towards appropriately so taking us towards this place where you're going to share an initiative and some other things, but can I go back real quick to just the resiliency aspect? Absolutely. You know what, James, I mean, you had these things happen to you and you shared the story of you and your brother and you made different choices. And was there ever a time, little James, was there ever a time that you just found yourself downtrodden as heavy, the weight was heavy and, and contemplating, man, it just the path of least resistance would be just to give into this thing and, and let my circumstances, you know, okay. beg upon yeah. others to help me. Well, I, I, as an adult, no, never. As an adolescent, absolutely. Junior high was a very tough part of my life where, where she divorced my stepdad. Yeah. Now we're living in the projects of Smithville. You know, the, I mean, the projects, the, the cockroaches are flying across the living room floor. We got to leave for one day while they bomb it, you know, to kill all the bugs. I mean, that was the hardest part. You know, my mom did the best she could, I believe. And she worked at the cafeteria. So I'm getting ridiculed. Now, keep in mind, I'm a teenager getting ridiculed of a mom working at the cafeteria. These other people are, have nice families and I didn't have that. So that was the hardest time for me. You know, some, some of the kids I think might've known that my, my brother was, was turning South and, you know, getting in jail, getting arrested, going to prison, getting out of prison, going back to prison. My father's in prison. It's just all this dysfunction. And it was so embarrassing for me. And I think 
looking back that that was the drive for me to say, you know what, it ends with me. And that was the decision that I made. I was like, you know what, enough's enough. I'm going to break the chain. I'm going to break the dysfunction. And I had, by God's grace, these these folks from church, uh, my youth pastor, Kicker, some friend, Mike and Joan Wintrock, invited me in their home. It was so bad. I had to leave my grandmother's house because I'd wake up in the middle of the night and my older brother would just start beating the mess out of me while he's high on crack. Mm. So they're like, man, we got to take this guy from this bad environment and they put me up for a semester in, in their house. And I think that love, you know, some people plant the seed, some watered it, some stir it up and 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 and, and put in sunlight, some water it again. And and that was them planting the seed of me. And then the youth pastor comes in and cultivates that and kind of yeah. keeps me growing, so to speak. And I, and that that was the difference for me. But That's- the, the adolescent years were the hardest. That's what I wanted. Thank you, James, for being so vulnerable and transparent. That's I just wanted to come back there because I didn't want people to hear, oh, I had this, but I just chose right. to go a different way. Because I know there had to be times that were just very difficult for you. And and yet sure. at the end of the day, you still sought goodness for yourself. You had dreams and goals and you didn't give up on those things. And I just wanted people to to hear that we all go through tough things. And, and yet on the other side of that, if we choose to continue to stay in pursuit, there's a lot of goodness. Oh, it is a ton of goodness. You just have to choose to look for it. Now, now I'll say this and you guys edit it out if you don't want it by any means, (laughs) but I, you know, you, you mentioned that, you know, well, some people say, well, you just choose it. Well, that's all easy to hear, but hard to do sometimes. So I won't say to who done this to me, but I've been beat with horse switches to my butt bled. Mm. I was, I mean, physically abused to where we were kneeling, holding hands. My brother and I have to say, I love you. I love you. Just mentally abused like that or or else you're going to get your butt beat. And that's horrible to say, but it it happened to me. You know, we pulled weeds until our sunburns got sunburnt in Mm. the horse pen for punishment. You know, we've had plates cracked over our head when, when we get an argument in the kitchen. So two prong forks poked in my leg, a, yeah. a, what you would flip a steak with on the grill. Right. And, and I think that's part of the reason my brother went one way, but where me, I was like crying inside looking for help. Yeah. And, and the Lord provided for me a, a, a way out of that. But, mm-hmm. but like you say, it's a lot of abuse. So, you know, for those folks that are going through that, seek help, choose, you know, the, the good life versus woe is me and just throw in the towel you can't throw in the towel you got to fight for your life and in in the chain in the cycle did you ever go like did you ever seek like mental health like therapy or anything like that you know that that brings up a subject i haven't thought about in quite some time so right at this time my brother and i are in i think he was a sophomore i might have been an eighth grader or freshman we go to counseling over here in san marcus Mm-hmm. To Dr. Herndon at the time was his name. And all I remember is they're talking. My mom, my mom and my brother and I always go. And I think my stepdad went once. But every time we went to the counselor, I felt like I was getting punished when I get home. Of like, well, we can't do this anymore. We have to do it this way. Well, how'd that make you feel? Blah, 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 blah. And it just all this, it, it was like every time I went to counseling, there was a consequence or a or a new action I had to take. Or and, and as a rebellious kid. You know, I, I'm just trying to survive at home. You know, school was a whoo light off the pack, but I got to deal with the kids that are poking fun and those those sorts of things. Now, keep in mind, they didn't mean it. They're adults now, and we all look back and yep. wish we didn't say things and do things. But, you know, but I don't know. I mean, we we had counseling, but to me, I, I found my refuge in church, and and that was the difference for me. April sixteenth of ninety one. I had a friend of mine, Wendell Washington, invite me out to Rosanke Baptist Church. And and man, their youth group was on fire. They had like Saturday Night Live, like live kind of skits. And all my friends that I was going to school with are doing all this. I'm like, wow, that's so cool, you know? And 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 that's what, what changed me is getting getting in church and seeking I, the good life. I me love personally. This. 
I love that you shared shared that, James. I mean, God love you. I'm a guy of faith too, right? I, <clears throat> I will tell you, I'm a very different person today because of my faith walk and what my creator has done in me. So I love that you brought that in too, right? I also am not afraid to tell those listeners. I think I've said it before. I have a therapist I go to still once a month. You know, it's good for me to have somebody sitting across from me who will objectively you know, look, look at and listen to the, the things I'm sharing and let me know what's, you know, validate what's right and to call me out on my BS. The when, signs when we call each other out. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, oh, yeah. that's, 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 that's different. And then <laughs> that's different independent, but just on our faith part, James, I just, I love to remind people, Jesus was meek, not weak, right? He chose, that's it. he chose to be meek. And, uh, and I think there's something about our spirit that endears us to other people when we choose that. Absolutely. And, and with those folks that, that, that are trying to bring that into my life, because I was kind of like, man, I don't want to hear none of this. You know, <laughs> at the time I was kind of getting a hard heart because now I'm getting more of the rebellious adolescent stage of trying to figure out what to do. And I started making some bad choices, you know, and there's a, there's a water tower in Smithville. I think to this day, I'm not sure. I haven't been there in a couple of years, but I, in high school, I climbed this water tower with my cousin and spray painted a happy face on it. Now keep in mind, I can have been doing a lot worse, but you know, I hopped this fence and climbed the water tower and the cops shining the light as we're coming down, you know, and he's like, what are y'all doing? And he called us by name. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, how does this guy know my name? I'm never in trouble. You know, well, I finally got caught. He knew my older brother cause he's in the law all the time. Oh. So, yeah. So, I, I mean, it's those kinds of things and that, yeah, I, I needed those folks to step in. When they're like, you know, they put their arm around and say, hey, let's go down this road. Let, let's come to church on Wednesday. What are you right. doing? As you shared the story about the water tower, I was going to say, I'm sure the Statue of Limitations has run out by now. So you're... <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I, I, I did get busted. I think I had a, a class A, a misdemeanor for criminal <laughs> trespass and criminal mischief. Yeah, so oh, I hear you. Me too, Me too brother. Anyway, Me too. but. Yeah, I'm going to so, let Donna get us probably back on track because James, you and I could have a lot of fun talking about this. May be a whole nother episode in the future. <laughs> I can there see a coffee, a coffee day yeah. coming up between the two of you. <laughs> oh, absolutely. So, so after you kind of, you know, you started realizing like, no, boss, I am, I can figure this out, right? So you got the RV park, you've got the cedar post business you've got the coming from the you know landscaping business land clearing, yeah. yeah land clearing business like what and now you're married and and now the children are coming and you gotta like you gotta lock it down here right you can't just be doing like take it out of the savings as you're putting it back in <laughs> yes so so once i met winter maybe i don't know a few months maybe the the prop so I have 2.95 acres in the front behind us there was a survey markers going up and I knew it was a big ranch you know it's wooded area behind us so I'm like you know I see this guy at the gate like a quarter mile down the road towards New Braunfels so I'm like hey you know are you guys interested in, in selling any of this I'm sure you're just buying it because the survey flags are going up he's like well what do you what do you have in mind I said anything inside the creek can you sell me what's inside the creek and he's like yeah, sure. Have it surveyed. We'll sell it to you. I'm, I'm going to sell it to you at a premium. And, and I, I've never met a stranger in case you haven't noticed. So, you know, this guy's like, let me talk to my dad. And they sold it to me. So then with the bright idea, being a Marine, I, I opened a bar here on the property in an old tire shop. We called it the Lug Nut Saloon. It lasted, <laughs> I didn't know it la <laughs> Yeah, it, it lasted a whole six months because my my mismanagement, ignorance of running a business of that magnitude of, of, of you know, not having the point, point of sale kind of computer stuff to keep track of the beers and the cases. Long story short, we, we funded some folks living here at Canyon Lake. After six months, we closed it down because they were making the money and we weren't. We were losing. <laughs> so the intent was to open that bar to fund the RV park. And this was my son's 12 now. So this is 12 years ago. So now, now we just opened in two one of twenty, two one of twenty one. We opened the RV park two one of twenty one, and and now we've grown it to twenty one slots. So so now we have that starting to, to flourish. So as that's growing, now I'm shrinking down the land clearing business and and all this and that to make another move here this coming spring for the RV park. That's amazing. And I you, feel like oh go ahead. Oh, you still have the storage up there too, right? You have the storage yeah, and the RV park. 
Correct. We yeah. still do the land clearing, still have the Sardin's boat and RV storage and the RV park. However, we're, we're phasing away from the land clearing because we're growing the RV park, which is a lot easier on the back. Keep in mind, I'm 46. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not the 29 spry little Marine guy out, you know, out of the fresh out of the core anymore. So yeah, yeah your stamina is not, not starting to always be there for you, right? At this point. That's, that's right. Yeah. I feel like I should say to our listeners, and this is Beyond the Front Lines, episode one of 12 with James Eastland. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Because we just, this story, there's a lot to this. We can just. I told you it was going to be an intro. I didn't even give Jay any info. No, I had nothing. I said, right? you're just going to hear this because let me tell you, it's, it's quite the story. I don't know, but I'm oh, having fun yeah. with every bit of this. This is good. You're great. Yeah, there, there, there might be a story or two I tell you offline. Or oh, I got you. I wanna... <laughs> we'll meet at the love net for that. So. Hey, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, so after, so now you're kind of getting things, you know, a little more formalized. You have how many children now at this point? Four. Four. Yeah, you didn't. Oh, excuse master- me, three. Whoa, whoa, oh. three. Whoa. <laughs> oh, that's gonna get on me. <laughs> You're not getting surprise Father Day cards, are you? <laughs> no, I have three children. There you go. <laughs> Wesley, Sophie, and Emily. There you go. Oh, very cool. And so you start now. You have freedom, right? You're in entrepreneur land and, and you are now have this freedom. So, so I'm kind of scrolling it ahead a little bit. He's, he's growing this park. He has the freedom and now he's jumping in as super dad over here. And, oh, actually I'm going to time that out, back that up because we got to get to when you decide you're going to help operation float a soldier, right? Okay. Cause that happened first before Yes. So, so maybe three years ago, I met a gentleman, Farron Smith, who's associated with Wes at Operation Float a Soldier, OFIS. So my daughter, who is now 11, she was, what, eight at the time? She's like, Dad, when can I start doing races? And I'm like, well, baby, you can, you can race whenever you want to. You can do this next one with me. So I signed up for this race, an off-road race, mountain bike race called Salida to the Sea, Salida, Colorado to Port Orford, Oregon, 2,000 mile off-road, hundreds of thousands of feet elevation gain, and this little devil wants to ride with me. I'm like, bet. So we go out and buy a tandem mountain bike. So she starts doing all these training rides with me, and and it's on YouTube, you know, Sophie's Sophie's Ride, Volume 3 or something like that. So she's doing all these rides with me, these 100 milers, training overnight rides with me, and this girl's hardcore. She's eight so, years old doing this? Yeah, she's eight years old on, on the back of the tandem bike with me. Yes, ma'am. Oh, holy cow. So, so, so we, we, we start, I, well, let me back up. I started raising money for Ophis before she got on board and wanted to do the fun fundraising, sort of speak, stuff with me. She's like, Dad, you're really not cutting it. You know, you're not making that much money for the charity. How about I help you? And I'm like, well, let's go, baby. And soon as she jumped on board to fundraise for Ophis, you know, the donations come in because here's right. this little eight-year-old, you know, she she made the New Braunfels Zeitung front page of the whole paper and everything. And, and and so everyone got on board. So we go to Colorado to Salida to start this race. We come up, climb up out of Salida, Marshall Pass. It's, I think it's 9,500 feet, give or take. And we cross the Continental Divide to get our picture taken. So we start the descent. And she was only going to ride the first 300 miles with me of this race. And then I was going to switch bikes and finish the race with school for her and everything. She couldn't miss that long. So we get on the descent and at mile 33, I hit a rock and my inexperience of having all the saddlebag weight, her on the back, the bike is already top heavy. I lay it over. Mm -hmm. I break a collarbone. I get 12 stitches in my left forearm and she is road rashed. No. entirely on her left side of the bike i mean horrible oh. so that ended her biking expeditions with dad and since then she got into softball so uh, she just now maybe a month ago decided that she'd get back on the bike with me and maybe go down river road to the to green and have a coffee and maybe back up river road to Kenya lake you know but, but. so she she started at that point to to get on board and fundraise for that's them. impressive I'll, I'll just make a plug for the national champion like i don't know five times in the last seven year oklahoma sooners softball team in case she's looking for a good college <laughs> <laughs> there, 
Well, she's a diehard Aggie fan, so okay. she would rather well, be an Aggie okay. than have a, have a ring from the I have no yeah, problem but, with that either. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> that's but great. But I'm sure she'd go, Yeah, thank you so much. It's all her, you know. That that was her ability. So now she's she's into the softball stuff and 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 you know, now I'm I'm getting more into the ultra endurance cycling myself at the well, moment. Well, let me I want to back up just a tiny bit. When you get out of the military, did you you kept up all the endurance stuff, right? You found that that was a you you kind of kept yes, up. yeah. So I've I've always ran not at the level I did in the Marine Corps, but I ended up going to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, to do the Ironman up there. I think it was the right. last year that they had it. They canceled. I think it's maybe only a half Ironman now, but yeah. So I I kept doing that, and you know you got the Cap Ten Capital Ten Thousand in Austin. That became our family tradition. So when my boy, he must have been six months, nine months old, you know, I'm out there in a baby jogger pushing my son. And like, we will be the first baby jogger dad team across the finish line. <laughs> and by golly, we were, we were. So, awesome. you know, it, it, it's always endurance. And now the kids are getting older that they're getting in involved with it too. So I got to find, you know, a way to put them on a bike and take them with me. So I'm not missing time away from them. So. That's impressive, but, though. That's super impressive. It is. Yeah, unreal. So when you okay, so you that endurance has always been part. There it is. Now your daughter kind of got involved. Then your daughter's like, okay, that was fun. We're gonna hold, and and now your kids are doing softball. So this is kind of where I want to bring it now. So just remember, this guy has been endurance the whole time. He's and he likes to give back, right? You got with Ofis, and a lot of him is giving back to the community. Yeah, love it. And so now. His endurance, his never met a stranger, his wanting to give back, his children, all of it come together now. So tell them what's going on right now, which I just think is neat. Yeah, so to finish that story, Sophie ended up raising almost $5,000 for Operation Flow to Soldier, which, which helps put on the events here at Canyon Lake, right? Yep. Right. yep. So yeah, she did. She did phenomenal on that. So the latest thing was, I think in about 2018, my wife showed me this documentary about this cross country bicycle race. Okay. It's called the Trans America bike race. It goes from or Astoria, Oregon to Yorktown, Virginia, 4,176 miles yeah. self-supported. The clock starts when you leave and doesn't stop till you get to Yorktown, Virginia. So in 2018, I attempted this. Well, guess what happened? On day three, you know, trying to save time, I, I'm, I'm bicycling, beautiful meadow in Oregon, snow-covered mountains in the back, Angus cattle in the in the meadow. So I'm trying to take a picture while cycling. Well, next thing you know, I land on my head in the middle of the street. I wreck again. I break three ribs. I drop from the race. So, yeah. So I go back this past year, 2022, enter this race again, race across the country, huge problems with my tendons. I, I got that under control. I get to Missouri, Kentucky, and Virginia, and now my bike starts to break, like components that shouldn't break are breaking. So long story short, I finished, I think, 10th overall, 25 days. Wait. So I get back here, and, and I feel like I left some days on the table because I think I left about, you know, because I'm driving, I have to hitchhike. I have to pay a guy 200 bucks to drive me two and a half hours down to Damascus, Virginia, to fix the bike, and then go back up. Then the next day it happens again. Winter's on her way to the finish line to pick me up. She drives me from there down to somewhere in Tennessee, Johnson City, Tennessee, I believe, and I go back. So I, I, I lost several days in the race. So I get back, and I'm like, man, I left some days on the table. I probably left a day with the injury, you know, first part of the race. And I hear, I, I, I can go into the story about the, Canyon Lake softball girls field up here. Mm -hmm. So I'm up there. I volunteer to mow the grass. Always, I wanted to be a coach, but I hadn't had to pay grade yet. I, I'm just getting involved. So I'm up there mowing the grass and the vice president, Heath, he's up there. And I say, hey, Heath, you know, uh, I see we got the light light poles here. When, are, when is field one and field three getting poles? He laughs and says, well, James, you know, we're, we're voluntary donation 501c3. And it's taken us 12 years to get the lights. Now, keep in mind, they, the Corps Engineers owns the land. They sublease it to Comal County. Or no, they lease it out to Comal County. Comal County subleases it to Canyon Lake Girls Softball Association. So they, they are funded off of donations. Well, the county has told us we have to break it down in increments because their budget or whatnot. 
that, you know, after 12 years, we finally get four light poles. Well, these light poles cost $31,000 a piece. Just the poles. Just the poles with the wiring, everything in the ground. So, you know, we have field one that has no lights and the T-ball field, which I have a T-baller, my little girl, Emily, 6U. They have no lights and this other field has no light. Well, we can't host tournaments of any magnitude because when the light, like, like now, daylight savings, hey, at five o'clock, you're done, you know? Right. So I asked Heath, I said, hey, can I fundraise for you? He's like, by all means, James, go for it. So I'm like, bet. Here's a, here's a challenge and I'm a Marine. I got like, okay, let's, let's get her Here done. We go you know? again. Yeah. So, so then it takes me back to the race. I'm like, you know what? I can go back and raise money for the King Lake Girls Softball Association. I can go back and re-race this race, hopefully with no problems this time. But this time I talked to my wife, got her blessing, winner, God, God bless her. Cause she's the one going to cover for me while I'm gone. So thank you, honey. So I said, well, I'm going to do the Trans Am again in June of 2024. So I'm going to race from Oregon to Virginia. But this time, but this time when I get to Virginia, I'm going to turn around and go back. Right. <laughs> and for, for 8,300 miles, and I want to do it under 50, 50 days on a bicycle. And I'm hoping that somebody gets the word, another entrepreneur, maybe hears this podcast that y'all have interviewed that could help us spread the word to say, you know what, these girls in Canyon Lake deserve lights on their field because the boys a quarter mile down the road at the same complex have six fields, all with lights, all with lights, every field. And our girls are just as deserving or more, in my opinion, because now they're they're competing without it. So, and and if I'm not mistaken, our, our vice president, Heath, told us that we produce more scholarships than the boys at the baseball fields do for our girls. Wow. And we have no lights and a, and a facility yeah. that's not fully functional. Yeah. So n- now I see it as a my my goal, my my new journey to get these girls lights. Because, you know, once my girls are out of the system, they're gone. But you know what? That's the gift. If I can help get these girls lights, that stays there past the Eastlands in the softball. This is- now, now it's up for the, you know, some of these kids – that went through Canyon Lake Girls Softball Association are now coming back as parents, putting their girls through it. And it's just like, it's not acceptable in my opinion for Comal County, not to have facilities for the girls. When, when last week we're down in God bless them, uh, South of San Antonio in Pleasanton and Jordanton or whatever down there out, out way further South where money's even more scarce in my opinion that have fully, feels fully funded with lights and pulls up and been there. And it's just not acceptable for me, in my opinion, yeah. of Comal County not to provide for our girls. Well, this is about equity, right? And I love your passion for this and it's going to happen. And so I do, I'm going to reiterate what I just heard you say, James, to all of our listeners. I don't care when you're hearing this message, there's need, there's an opportunity. You can make a difference. You can help support this. So jump in jump in on this thing and you can contact Donna and I, and we can, we can help make all the connections, but but I agree, James, this is a worthy cause. I love it. And man, you, I love your heart, your family's heart winner too. This is good stuff. Well, I I appreciate that. So this, this past season, I, I got to be an assistant coach with a 12 U team and, and coaching. So my, my 12 year daughter, Sophie has taken lessons from our, our, very well-loved coach. He was the head coach for Smithson Valley High School, Lisa Daigle, where they won the state championships up there three years. And so we, we were fortunate enough to come along her to start coaching our girls. And and it's just like her, her passion is overflowing and you see the love of Christ in her. And it and and to see those looks that when my, my kids get it made me want to start coaching. So I, I become an assistant coach. And when you coach these girls, and I duplicate her, Coach Daigle, the best I can, but to fail because I'm nowhere near her level. But I get to coach these girls on the on the rec league and and tell them what to do and this and that. And to see their look in their eyes when the light bulb goes on of this is why we swing the bat this is way, this is why we turn the hip and the back foot, and this is why we reach this way. And the light bulb goes off, you know, and it's just like it's so rewarding. Yeah. But that's all being missed because we don't have the facilities, the lights at the facilities. So. Yeah, you're touching hearts. Y'all are touching hearts. And, you know, James, I talk about this all the time, which is legacy. Right. And, uh, and to me, at some point, I recognize I will be dust on this earth. 
And, uh, and, and I want there to still be people with air in their lungs who say, I once met this guy named Jay. And that's let me, it. Yeah. Let me tell you the impact he made. Right. So that's what you're doing in a lot of young lives. And uh, man, that's incredible. Well, thank you so much. I, I truly believe that I'm the one that's blessed to, 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 to be around the kids because they teach us adults as much as, as we teach them. And sometimes more just because of the fact that you know, they don't know politics. They don't know the grand scheme of things or whatever. And it's pure, genuine hearts. Yeah. And it's just for the love of softball. And oh, if my 55-year-old to... body could only go back to a more youthful, easy, easy <laughs> life of, of like you're describing. I hear you. But what... Hey, man, we'll pick up a bicycle and come join me sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Careful, don't tempt me. Don't tempt me. But, you know, <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, Yes, I, I agree. I have two kids and they, they blow my mind all the time with what they pick up on and, and what they learn. And But you've been through, you own a lot of t-shirts <laughs> <laughs> and and you've made a pretty quilt out of them all. And, yeah, that's nice. and you are now able to pick out those kids that are probably struggling and you get to put your arm around them and say, Hey, why don't we come down this road, you know, instead of absolutely. And even now you telling your story, you know, energy is energy, you know? And I, it's funny because I know we're going to wrap this up, but it reminded me there was a little girl that long story short, she was on our bus and I was, I was in, you know, maybe high school or older junior high, you know, And anytime the bus driver would tell her, you need to sit down and she was a good girl, but you know, sometimes she was standing or whatnot and he's like, you need to sit down. She'd get this look over her eyes. She'd glaze over and she would wet her pants like almost every time. Right. And I was really curious. I'm like, that, that's just kind of wild. Right. I didn't understand it. And then in my years as a nurse and all that background, I could look back and say, oh my God, she was heavily abused. I, we found out a little later, I think my mom actually helped intervene a little and, and get her some protection, but she was abused. Scroll myself up like 20 years, or maybe not that long, but yeah, I guess close to 20 years. And I'm actually helping somebody deliver, you know, labor. She's a labor and delivery patient and she's having her first baby. And I give her direction and she freezes up and she doesn't connect with me. And I immediately go back to that little girl and I actually asked her parent, her husband, I need to, I don't need any details, but I need to know if there's been abuse in her past. And he was jaw dropped that I actually knew that he's like, is it in her chart? And I'm like, no, it's not. It's just how she's connecting. So you have that knowledge that you will pick up on things that a lot of people won't and you are going to be, and you are, you know, so helpful to them. You're impacting so many lives. Oh, well, thank you so much. I I certainly want to do my part and give back because I know I had a rough rough childhood and upbringing, but I feel like I'm, I'm so lucky that, that I got out of that dysfunction Mm -hmm. and that cycle. And one thing that I want to do that I've, I've learned from my brother who, who went down the wrong road, in my opinion, is one time he was describing his stay in, in jail as as striped sunshine. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, if you have the bars on the window and the light shines through, you only see the sunshine as striped. So God willing, once I get my RV park fully finished and developed out, I want to start the striped sunshine foundation and go into jails and prisons and low income subdivisions and, and housing to say, hey, 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 don't go down that road. Let's go down this one. I know one better. It, like somebody did for me. And and that's what I want to do now. I don't have to wait until then. I'm trying to do that now and give back with the, with the girls, you know, while I have kids up here at the, just building kids up. But yeah, that's exactly what I want to do is, is give back and love it. You know, it. just keep paying it forward. You, you are a special soul. Let me yeah. tell you. Yeah. Love every bit of this. You're going to touch lives just through them tuning in to check out this episode, James. Amazing. Absolutely. So I think we're going to wind this down and we did. I didn't know if we'd get through the whole story because there was a lot going on, but I think we did pretty good. <laughs> I think it's one sure. that say we've said this on a few others. We have to, we may have to bring him back just for we, an update. We may. Point, oh, right yes. There. Most definitely. Sure, yeah. We, 
after the okay. Transamerica. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Absolutely. June of 2024. You betcha. Right. June of 2024. So I got, I have time to train. That's what I hear. When you, <laughs> when you said that to me earlier, I thought, James, I'm, I'm willing to give that a go, but that 25 days is going to be more like 125. I think. I so. uh, again, it's just about finishing. So there you go. You just got to finish. Sorry. His girlfriend. I hope she's hearing this. Yeah. Because yeah, she's probably like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome yeah all right so any last words from you james yeah we just would ask folks that if they want to follow my journey of, oh, of the yeah. training some of these rides and training rides that i'm trying to do i'll bike from here to bogosa springs colorado that's wow. just under a thousand wow. i'll bike again to nashville for a training ride just under a thousand i'm going to do a 10k swim here at canyon lake back and forth along the dam to raise money for these girls for the softball lights. Is I'm there a do place? 100... Is there like a central? A, a, web, a website, a social media? Yeah, so, so so the place that I post all these videos, the updates for the amount of money we've raised so far, which is very little, I think $1,400, we need to raise $186,000 for six light poles. $31,000 a piece times six is $186,000. The Facebook group page, I post all of this on in the videos of the races and crazy events I do is the Facebook group page, Journey of the Five. Journey All spelled of the Five. Out. Journey of the Five. And oh, that's where I post that. F-I-V-E. There's a link. F-I-V-E, yes, ma'am. Okay. And, and there's, a, there's a link on that where people can donate with the QR code if they want to help, or much more importantly, or just as importantly as to share it and help us turn the lights on here in Canyon Lake. Well, I'm in for a hundred dollars right now. There'll probably be more, James, and I'm just going to ask the listeners match me. That's what I'm asking. Just match me. Join in. There you go. Thank Let's you so get, much. Yeah. Get this thing moving. Yep. Thank it, you it, much. <clears throat> and I'm I'm good for another hundred. I thought so. you were about to say. Oh, excellent. They do. That's that's say hey, I'm I'm a, I'm a generous guy, but. <laughs> yeah hey we're we're grateful if everybody gave a hundred bucks we'd have these lights on, Come on. By tomorrow that's what i'm talking about let's do yes. this let's do so this. If, if, you know we just had our closing ceremonies here at kenya lake girls softball association which is behind the canyon lake dam here yep. in, in kenya lake and if you look on there we just had a a t-ball long ball derby you know these girls are six u five u some four u yep. Yeah. They can't hit home runs yet. So we had a contest to see how far they can hit it. That's awesome. And there's there's these girls on a podium we made. And just look at their faces and the pride they, they have when they hold up their trophy that they won, you know. And Love that's it. what it's all about. It's building up those girls. But all those pictures are on there. And if you could just help us spread the word and, and you know, help us turn the lights on, we'd be grateful. That's right. awesome. I love We're it. We're going to get it out there. We're going to put it out on our, when we post the, the podcast, it'll be out underneath the summary under their social media and where that's yeah. going to be. Oh, cool. Yep. We'll nice. have that all out. So perfect. What do you got? No, nothing. Just James, I really appreciate you taking the time. I do think we're, we're uh, kindred spirits. I don't have the, the stamina, the endurance, the athleticism that I hear from you, but uh, I certainly have the passion that you have and, just thank you for blessing us. Thank you for what you're doing in the community. Thank you for your story of resilience. I think people need to hear that. And uh, and I just say, if there's ever anything that I can do for you, I hope that you won't hesitate to reach out. Honored to get to meet you. Absolutely. It's truly my pleasure to meet both of you, Donna and Jay. Thank you both for having me. And and both of you, thank you for your service. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Likewise. We're grateful. So Jay loves to do quotes, and and so I'm going to copycat him today. I actually found this quote that I thought was super appropriate talking about resiliency today, and it's actually by Helen Keller, which there you go, you know, somebody that had to be quite resilient, mm -hmm. and although the world is full of suffering, it's also full of the overcoming of it. So Ooh, I think you, you are a great example of that, James. I mean, you're, you know, I know the audience can't see you, but you, you have a bright smile, yeah. and you're probably one of the happiest people that I've met, you know, in a sincere way. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah. You know, you, you just mentioned the quote there. One, one that's pulled me in the right direction is whether you think you can or you can't, either way, you're right. Either way, you're and, right. And, I, and, and that's done so much for me. But yeah, th Henry, thank you both. Henry Ford. Ford. Yeah. Have yeah, I thought it was Henry Ford, but I wasn't positive. Yep. <laughs> So I have to laugh because a good friend of mine, unfortunately, he, he's no longer with us. He passed away in a car accident, but 
in our office, he would put these quotes, he would say all these quotes. And so as being funny, I went through and wrote a bunch of them and framed them. And that was one of them. Yeah. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. I've wrote that one inside of Sophie's softball glove. You know, whether you can, you can, yeah. Yeah. So when she opens it up, she'll see it, you know, and she's out there with self doubt or she misses a ball or something that, you know, just stick with it, kid. And, and, and that's what life's about. Whether you're a softball player or an adult, you know, life throws us some blows sometimes and it is whether you think you can or you can't, it's up to you. That's right. Well, and choices. Yeah. The choice is yours. No matter how hard it seems and overwhelming it seems, the choice is always yours. Absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent. All right. Well, we're going to wrap this up. And I just want to, you know, as always, thank our audience for sharing time and space with us. We couldn't do this without having everybody kind of on board and listening. And we are so thankful for that. So if you hear the podcast, you like the podcast, we would love for you to share, to like it, to talk about it and engage with us. Because honestly, we love to hear from our audience. You can always go through Coming Home Well. They get all the messages to us and just be part of it. Join the conversation. Right, Jay? Yeah. 100%. So on behalf of all of us here at Beyond the Front Line and our parent podcast coming home well, we thank you and we hope you guys have a wonderful week. Bye for now, everybody. Thanks for listening to Beyond the Front Line, a podcast of coming home well. Join us every other Wednesday. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. Follow us on Instagram at ComingHomeWell underscore BTS or on Twitter at ComingHomeWell. Thanks again. And until all are home and all are well.